tu sei qui con me Questa stanza non ha più pareti Ma alberi Hi, I'm Edith, I'm 12 and I go to real school in Budapest Hi, I'm Iris, I'm 11 and I go to real school in Budapest I like doing ballet, ping pong and I like to crochet This is my dad who's 55 and 3 quarters so we've we've arrived today like a for those of you who are my age like a kind of educational version of the osmonds um i'm, I'm glad i'm glad you like that lena thank you um <clears throat> but we're going to share with you a little bit about our school about real school and the i one of the ideas sitting behind it is it's a school where you get to dream and build a beautiful world and there's no real better reason to get up in the morning. Ed Edmund, yesterday I, I loved the passion that you brought to, 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 your, to your talk um, and that sense of relationship with young people and care for your profession. Um, and that's the thing that brings us all here together today, the idea to do something that we really care about, to dream and build a beautiful world, to transform the nature of the things that we really believe in around education. Um, you can see Alex and Bendy, um, so I'm pointing to the little screen, Alex and Bendy uh, behind me, uh, they're, they're captured by nature. Um, they care about the things that they're doing. We're going to share a little bit about some of the projects that we do, and we're going to talk about some of the people, and we're going to talk about perception because the, the, the neuroscientist Bolotto that we work with, that's his special field, is around the way that we make sense of the world. And we're going to talk about this idea of science as a way of being as well, and more to that later. Science lessons both took us through a process of joining the lab, so it didn't feel like we were just in school. Now I'm going to invite you to join our lab, so I'd like everybody to stand up, please. So I would like you to put on an invisible lab coat and ask yourself, if you're ready to be creative and playful and ask questions. If you are, well done, you can sit down. If not, be prepared to stand up for the rest of the next 30 minutes. So, so I've been principal at Real School for just over two years. Um, I'm about to come to the end of my, my, my time at Real School at the end of this, of this term. The school's been going, uh, it's now in its fourth year. Um, and as I said, it's, it's got underneath it some really wonderful uh, things that are, that are going on. Uh, my background has been as a school, school leader in, in different places. Um, I, I formed the UK's uh, for, first uh, trauma-informed school because my background was working with really vulnerable young people who've been excluded. I've been the head of an all-through school, uh, the founding principal of an all-through school that had an arts focus, um, which was really interesting that they chose me as a science specialist. Um, but I think my passion is really about what makes people tick and around that learning, uh, that learning process. So um, the, the relevant part, as we said, is you know, we've got to focus on sustainability um, and, and for children's voice and agency within, within, within their projects. Um, the entrepreneurial piece, we see more as a, a mindset than about, uh, about business. It's about social impact, about making a difference. And the art field piece is very much around that process of making. We saw that at high tech high yesterday where the the sense of entering a studio entering uh, a workshop um that wonderful moment when the room just disappears because people are so absorbed in that making process my highlight at making at real school was making clothes i made a skirt and a top with the colors of ukraine 
We were raising money through our fashion show, and I thought Ukraine was a good cause. It brought joy to see my outfit all ready and finished. It made me think about how sustainable clothes are because of what they're made of, how they're made, and how much time people put into making them. My favorite art project was the four paintings I made. I love making them so much as they had a real meaning behind them, and the group planned their individual paintings to create an impact on the audience. So it wasn't just a painting of a tree. It was our topic, so we found it interesting. For example, you can see that Ryan chose to make a plastic jellyfish as he was passionate as he was passionate about sea life and plastic pollution. I chose to make four paintings about gender violence. To be able to share an issue that I really cared about in a top gallery was really amazing. I liked every project, but my favorite one was is the one we are working on right now. We are making. Oh, sorry. It's okay. It's okay. Um, well, it's interesting, isn't it? That 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 process that happens when you're nervous and excited. Um, I think I tend to speak more quickly when I'm nervous and excited. I so I, I the, the, like the like Filippo was saying, having that sense of awareness so you can take responsibility, and that's what good relationships do. Um, that Edith has a lovely phrase of being nervous sighted, and I think the three of us are definitely in that space today. Um, the the model here uh, is is trying to represent something that I think we're all grappling with um, that, that, is, that isn't easy um, by its nature it, because it's something that we care about things like climbing a, a mountain uh, climbing Everest it's not supposed to be easy but it's really worthwhile and I think where we are and somebody else talked about this yesterday is the space between a current reality uh, and our dreams and that's that's not easy. There's a challenge of how to journey between between those two. I just want to give a, a physical representation of that challenge for a minute. And um, we've been talking about embodied perception. There was a lovely um, uh, one of the things I thought of when I was listening to Felipe. There's a Papua New Guinean phrase, which is that learning remains rumor until it enters the body, until it enters the mus muscle. And I think that's so true. So if we could, if you could just interlace your fingers um, and just notice which one's on top and then put, it, put your thumbs together just in a really relaxed way. This isn't a trick. It's not, it's not a challenge. It's not an, a, an assessment which is going to decide whether you get a break or not. Um, and then just take your hands apart and bring, bring them together again. And hopefully that doesn't feel too challenging for a Saturday morning and just nice and easy. But doing something as simple as changing which finger is on top and which thumb is on top and starting to do it. Now, this for me is the challenge that, you know, for most of you, that will start to feel much less comfortable. And this is the challenge that we're all facing as educators because we're trying to enter into new ways of doing it. And we've got to have that experience, as you were suggesting, Filippo, that because this isn't just a theoretical idea around this is the right way of doing things. We've got to have the experience to, to learn from these things. So a little bit about our pedagogy, our, our approach. It's not as simple as a model. It includes lots of various different things, some of the things that you've heard various people talking about. But it starts with experience. We want to hook the learner, but it's good. It's more important than that. The teachers who ask children to write a poem about the sea, but the children have never been to the sea. You know, it starts with felt experience and allows them to engage in a world so that they can, then can dream. They can think about what's possible. And then from there, you can plan. A friend of mine used to say, wouldn't it be wonderful if dreaming was a part of the national curriculum? I think he was spot on there. We then go into the making process where you make and you remake. We make things more than once. You get feedback, not just from your educators, but from people with expertise, people who maybe are a scientist or an artist. And then we share to a real audience with edge because you're not just sharing to your teacher. It's maybe somebody that matters more. Maybe matters even more than your parents because there's people there that you don't know, a bit like for us today. And then we go through a review process. And again, the review and reflection process is, is ongoing. 
but there's a formalized part of that for us at the end of our projects where we're not only looking back, but we're looking forward so that we are deciding, we're thinking through as individuals based on our experiences, what are the things that we're going to take with us? I was most proud of the Sloth Fashion magazine because I did not only write an article for it, but I curated it and pulled it all together. It was very challenging and I spent so long staying up really late working on it, but finally seeing it printed out, hand sewed, packaged up, was so excited. When we shared it at last, it was nerve-wracking at first, like most things are, but then seeing people at the stool being interested in what we had created was so amazing. I liked every, I liked every project, but my favorite one is the one we are working on right now. We are making a film about Budapest. Our driving question is how can we inspire historical interests in the city of Budapest through film? We are, make, we are working with a filmmaker and a person from the Wheel of Budapest website to understand the standards needed. We weren't just learning about the history of Budapest, but many other parts of the whole world. I hope my group's film gets into the Wheel of Budapest website, which has lots of viewers. At Real School, at Real School we've had the privilege to work with people who are real experts. One of the school founders, award-winning filmmaker Vicky, has been mentoring us about how to plan and make a film. It's different than having a teacher because this is what she specializes in and she teaches university students. In the second lesson, she showed us one of her films. When I watched it, my face lit up because I was like, wow, maybe she could help me make a film like that. At the Vida Gudi Galleria, we had a chance to work with two street artists. One of them tries to keep himself secret and we got to meet him. It was a real privilege to meet someone who tries to keep himself anonymous. His street artist's name was Box with Wings. It was so exciting to get, get to know his personality. And every time I would see his artwork around the city, I would go, Box with Wings, and it would, lit up, and it would light up my face. We, we, were, we were working alongside each other and we were helping him. It was amazing. You wouldn't think your artwork would be in a gallery. When you see your work there, it brings joy. And you can see um, on the picture at the top, you've got a group of young children, uh, six, seven-year-olds, old, working with an artist uh, as a part of a workshop who had a visual impairment. And as a result of that, the children ended up making artwork for people with a visual impairment in the gallery, work, work that you went and felt as uh, you could still see it, but it was the focus of getting people to come and, and feel it. Their, their level of compassion and uh, engagement with a new audience came about through that project. Um, in the middle, uh, you've got a picture of Bo. Bo Lotto, just a, um, he's, he's an American. He, he, I, I will let him know that he was, he was British for a minute. He'll, he'll, I, well, I will like that for, for a moment. Um, and so one of the things that we've been talking about is, the, is this idea of neuroscience. And I think it's really important to recognize that neuroscience is a, is a, relative, is a distinct field, is a relatively new field. Um, in the in the late 1800s and throughout the 20th century, but being human um, and having a body is not, and it's easy I think sometimes to forget that. There's amazing insights that we can gain from the kind of research that we were talking about today, um, but it's it's so helpful to recognise that some of our instincts, like to get up and move, can be really important you know, to, to have fresh air, the, the door being open, that really helps in a, in, in, in a space. And this photo, I wanted to share this because it kind of captures lots of things that we need as people. And some of these needs are, they're age old, they're not, they're not new things. And um, they might translate differently as our perceptions change and as, and as the world around us change, our context changes. But if you look at the picture of Max and Noah, what you can see there uh, is a whole set of needs being met. Um, they were getting attention from, from me. There's this lovely sense of, of community and connection that was building at that point. Um, it was fun. They were getting status from other people. And I think if we were designing schools for some of these needs to be met, we would end up with a very different curriculum experience. 
and a different kind of pedagogy as well. So Bo's work is all around perception. And this next bit isn't a trick. Okay, I just want you to say, to, to have a think about what you can see. Um, so could somebody just call out, what can they see? Leaves and bark, yes, a trick. And, and so I, I was a bit disingenuous because it is a trick question. Okay, because there's actually something else there as well. And one of the interesting things about our brains is that often once we start to complete on a pattern, when we think we can see something and make sense of something, we stop seeing. But there's an animal in there. So some of you can see an owl. Now, some people can't because I can see that. And what's interesting then at that point is how our internal running commentary will start to take place. The, the voice in our heads, if you cannot see something now, you'll be maybe, uh, not least because other people can see it, you're starting to maybe get a bit frustrated. And the learning experience can be like this. Let's, let's add in a little bit of color. That might make it easier. But for some of you now, the internal running commentary will be going even more strongly with a louder volume because now I still kind of, I've, I've, I've supposedly been helped and I still can't see it. And learning and being in a community is like that. And we have to recognize just because we can see something as educators or as a, as a learner does not mean to say that other people can. Our brains are social organs. You know, it's, what, it's why confinement is a punishment. So helping people make sense of the way that they make meaning is really important in that process of learning. There's an owl, for those of the, you that you can just about make out the pointed ears. Iris was sure it was a butterfly. when, And it was really interesting. When we did this the other day, and you hadn't seen this, and then the excitement as you discover something. If anybody cannot see it, come and see me at the break, and I'll show you where it is. I'll put, put you out of your misery. Um, but that felt experience of discovery is a really important thing. There's an emotional attachment to discovering something and being in a group of people who are discovering things. And that's what our work as scientists, not learning about science, but being scientists was all about. Bo talks about not trying to change perception, but trying to expand it. If you think of the world we're living in today, where there are so many polemic views and it becomes I'm right and you're wrong and all of these kind of things, it's, it's, it's so important that we can work in a way that help young people, maybe with very different family experiences, expand their perception of what is possible. So the way we see things is obviously based on our personal histories and our personal experiences. Through being in a, in a family is a lovely example of how you can broaden your perception. Edith's passion for, for, for musicals, Iris is for ballet, Mine for football. We are learning from each other. I'm not so sure how much you're learning about football, but I'm certainly learning about musicals and ballet. And I wanted to talk a little bit about questions. As educators, we ask so many retrieval type questions. And the game becomes, can you guess what is in the educator's head? So if I use the example of Romeo and Juliet, an easy question, if I'm a an educator, a teacher, I might be asking, who killed, who killed Tybalt? I'm trying to find out what you already know. But a much more inquiry-based question is who was responsible for Tybalt's death. That could be a PhD. There isn't a simple answer to that. So the little things, like the style of our questioning, can have a profound impact on the way that we are engaging young people and the, the idea of knowledge being something and more importantly understanding being something that can be built. So the idea of expanding perception, one of the things that I wanted to share with you was that we talked yesterday about, about competencies. One of the words that wasn't brought into place was understanding. And I think that is 
one of the most important things we're trying to build with young people. It's the way that those emotions, the knowledge and the skills all come together in an embodied way. I think that sense of understanding being built is really important for young people and adults. And one of the things that I think is, is, is really significant in relation to understanding and awareness is that it's dynamic. So you can't take you can't take responsibility based on your awareness without sorry without having a sense of awareness of something. But if we if we take an area like a, 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 an example of knowledge of knowing that the capital city of France is Paris, okay, it's likely that that's a much more static piece of information. Whereas if I look at my ability to collaborate or to listen is going to change tremendously based on context. Sometimes if I'm stressed, I won't listen as well. I won't, in an area where I'm being asked to, to work in a, in a certain way, if I'm working around an area of education, I know I'm going to be able to collaborate and engage in a very different way than if I was looking at nuclear physics, because it's an area I don't understand. So I think one of the things we, we want to think about in our assessment systems, and the assessment, at the root of the word is to sit alongside. And I think that's what good educators do. They're alongside the children, alongside the young people. But this is a dynamic process that shifts with the, with the context. And as I think Felipe was, was making me think about this morning, based on the way that each individual in that room is perceiving things. So we're going to talk a little bit about science as a way of, of being. Actually, bef before we, we, we do, can we just go back to, to this? Because I wanted to talk about this particular cartoon. It's called, no, it's tails. It's head. It's tails. It's Look head. It. Look, Look at it. it. It's tails. It's head. So, go, go on. I'm trying, to, I'm, trying to, I'm trying to speak to everybody. So, the, the idea of a coin, I think, is such a, uh, I, I'd forgotten to mention it, and apologies for missing you out, Edith. Um, the idea of a coin is such a simple idea of there being more than two sides to things. It's a lovely metaphor for working with young people with autism, where they can actually see that I can be right and you can be right as well. So, I, I, and for anybody, when they get more stressed, they get that narrower field of perception. So. I think sometimes it, really little things can make such a difference. One of the things I wanted to share briefly with you about was about the black autumn bees. Science is a way of being, okay? And you, as you can see here, we've got uh, a bee uh, with, a pers with a perspex tube, and inside the tube is sugar water. And what I want to share with you is the flight of this bumblebee. The children at Black Autumn, what they did was they created a puzzle for the bees. And it was amazing. The, the children, you can't explain the rules of monopoly uh, to a bee. So you have to create a puzzle that you can watch to see if it's being sold. So if it was, it could be that the sugar water, if there's a blue color behind the tube, or if there's um, a, a yellow color in the, in the corner, it would be a rewarding thing for the bee. So what I wanted to share with you was this film of the flight of the bumblebee. This was a bee that had never seen, seen the world before. So it was hatched into this chamber, and it's flying around. And what's really fascinating is that it doesn't know what it's looking for. It doesn't know that there's sugar water there. And I can remember watching this animation. We, we'd been watching the bees, and Bo had made this into an animation. And I can remember saying to him, this is really random. And he said, yes, because when you don't know what you're looking for, being random is the most efficient way of discovering something. And boy, have we lost sight of that in our schools. Play is random sometimes. The opportunity to just like this be, be open to a discovery, maybe not even sure what I'm trying to discover, but to be able to be playful. 
This is the same B an hour later, okay, going back into, into, into the space, into the chamber. Gloriously efficient, okay? And I suppose one of the things that I'm asking you to think about is what's our model of, of learning promoting in our schools? Have we got the balance right? Certainly in many UK schools, it's about the efficiency. So we're going to talk now a little bit about an experiment that the girls did called Living Narratives in their work with Bo. So we created an experiment to see how people would walk in a circle marked by a rope. After trying this ourselves, we became curious about patterns of how people walked and how they might be formed. We then repeated it with a group of people at the gallery. We asked people to go into a circle and walk with three simple rules. The rules were, you have to keep walking, you have to stay in the circle, and you have to be silent. During the experiment, we made the circle progressively smaller and then larger to see how people would react and feel. My learning group then did the experiment with an individual to see how they would react alone. So this was, this was an experiment that the children designed uh, in, in, in the school in Budapest based on uh, a previous experiment that Bo had carried out in another place. And so they were building on prior knowledge. Just like the children who were working with the bees, Bo was acting as a, a, a kind of an embodiment of a literature review. Those children with the bees became the world's youngest published scientists. We had eight, nine, and ten-year-olds published in biology letters. It's called the Black Autumn Bees. So the children in, in Budapest, though, were building on this idea of, okay, well, we've had an experience. What, what are we becoming curious about? What are we wondering about? Science is often based on why and what if it's to do with this? So we carried out this experiment yesterday. Well, actually, that wasn't we. I, I wasn't involved. You, you carried out the experiment yesterday. Please enjoy watching this and just see what things you notice. What things do you think you might see happening? Do chat to the person next to you. What things are you seeing? What things are you noticing? Working in the school, we thought about personality type and leg dominance. We also began to look at disruption as a pattern in itself, asking why people might disrupt. Yesterday, most people were moving in an anti-clockwise direction, though some people were walking in the other direction. This also happened whenever we did the experiment. We were really excited to see that there were some differences. In yesterday's experiment, much more people disrupted than in school. 
I wondered if it was because the group at school wanted to fit in, well as the group yesterday wanted to stand out and were more confident to change. And I'm really curious about what things you were noticing there. Um, Edith, by being the scientist, it's not science as a recipe. It's science where you don't know what's going to happen. And yesterday it was, it was beautiful to see their excitement because of the difference in behaviours. And it made me wonder about whether or not there was, a, there was an element of the adults yesterday who were arriving for a, for a conference around innovation whether that was why we saw more people going in a clockwise direction than, than maybe we'd seen anywhere else before. It also made me then think about well, what if it is to do with disruption? What kind of experiences could you give people to help them be aware of themselves as disruptors? One person commented yesterday that it felt uncomfortable as the road came in. The rope came in, it, it, it felt less comfortable. And that's something that we've seen on many occasions when we carried out the, the experiment with people of different ages. And I think if we could, if we could get that sense of, I, th I think it was David yesterday talking about, about people taking those risks to, to go and, and, and make that effort to innovate within the constraints of a system or I mean, I feel very lucky at Real School because we're a group of people who are together um, with, a, with, with a real sense of vision and without a that sense of isolation. But if we can learn how to do that, that will have an amazing impact on, on the children that we work with. Um, one of the things that we're going to be doing in terms of we, myself and Bo, we're looking to create by scientist communities and to create uh, a virtual scientific community that builds on work around perception. So if any of you are interested in this, please do come and let us, let, let us know. Um, one of the things I, I, I wanted just to, to, to finish with is this, uh, this bit about for science, the importance of asking great questions. Sometimes when you, when you work with people who aren't educators, they ask a beautifully naive, and I don't mean naive in a silly way, but naive in a beautiful way, question, because they make you think differently. They, they raise your awareness to something that maybe you just take for granted because we're immersed in a particular world. And I think the, the bit I've always seen with Bo is he's, a, he's most excited as a scientist when he doesn't know. As an educator, I was trained to know things. As a head teacher, a principal, that means I'm really, really supposed to know things. And yet that's so unhelpful. It can stop and stifle the inquiry. So I, I really wanted to leave you with, with, with that part of thinking about questions. We would like to we would like to leave you with one final question. What pattern would you disrupt for a more beautiful world? Thank you for listening.